Good evening. My name is Lamin Jai, and this is The Nation Today. Thank you very much for joining me tonight on this show. Dr. Ismail Sise will be joining me on the show tonight to speak on various issues, in particular the past parliamentary election. He's my guest tonight. Big interview, so do stay tuned. The Gambia government is dismissing claims that a portion of the monkey park in Bijilo has been given to the U.S. Embassy. We have that report for you, but the Gambia is also celebrating World Malaria Day. Also, the Gambia Armed Forces conducted a patrol of the Gambia's border there in Fonyi. They brought journalists with them. Before all of that... <music> Very well. First, let's have my take for tonight. The victims last Friday held a press conference to condemn the appointment of Fabakari Tombong Jata and Sidin Jai into the National Assembly. They are rejecting the move and are saying that they are mulling a protest to demand for the resignation of the two men. There is no doubt that human rights violations have taken place in this country, violations of the highest order. There is also no doubt that the victims have been demanding for justice for these violations. I have always said, however, that the victims have to have justice, but this should be done reasonably. There has been a whole investigation that indicted those who were directly responsible for these crimes. The focus, therefore, and I said therefore, should be on those people really who have been indicted directly by the investigation into the human rights violations and abuses of the 22 years rule of former president yeah, Jame, and not those who have not been directly linked to these crimes. So the energy and the focus, it is my view, should be on those people who have been indicted by the TRRC directly to have committed violations in this country and really are not those who haven't done anything, at least, at least, going by the investigations. That will be it for my take tonight. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Now, the government has issued a statement dismissing claims or reports, if you like, that a portion of the monkey park has been allocated to the U.S. Embassy. This has more in this report. The government described the story as misleading for there has not been any evidence to corroborate that Minister Drame has sent a letter to the Justice Ministry instructing the monkey pack to be reassigned to the U.S. Embassy in Banjul. The Bijera Forest Park monkey pack was established in 1951. The species which fence woodland was gathered in 1952 and covered an area of 51.3 hectares, about half a square kilometer and is on the Atlantic Ocean Beach at the southern end of the Senegambia area of Kololi. The protected nature reserve is comprised primarily of a close canopy forest with a significant number of palm trees and with a relatively thin strip of herbaceous vegetation. In actuality, Monkey Park is a reserved land assigned to the Forestry Department of the Environment and Natural Resources Ministry and only they can determine what to do or not to do with that land. The Gambian government said they are fully conscious of the significance of the monkey park as part of our natural heritage and will jealously protect it for posterity. The disappearance of much of the wildlife and forests in the past two decades alone has significantly titled the country's ecological balance. However, the government assured in their statement that they will never allow that to reoccur. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Darug. Now, the military, the, over the weekend, conducted a patrol of the Gambian border there in Foni amid the uncertainty in Casamas involving rebels in Casamas and Senegalese uh, soldiers or Senegalese security forces. This time, the members of the armed forces of the Gambia came with journalists. They invited reporters to witness the patrol. More in this report by Modu Elbaji. 
the conflict between the Senegalese troops and the MFDC separatist forces has displayed many residents in the border villages as most of them seek sanctuary in neighboring communities as a result of the heavy firing and shelling. The Gambia Armed Forces managed to secure the area and bring back the internally displaced persons in some communities. However, after a short safety briefing at the QRF-1 military base in Kanilai, the team, led by Lieutenant Colonel Omar B. Bojang, drove to the border communities for inspections. Okay, just a few kilometers away from here, as you can see behind me, is the border between Gambia and southern Senegal, Kasamas. The QRF-1, under the command of um, Lieutenant Colonel O.B. Bojang, is here today on a patrol and to restore hope to the people and the residents of Balen. The Alcala of Balen village, Ibrahim Bojang, said they flee two times as a result of this selling. In their village, he thanked the army for their effort when the conflict was at its peak. The <laughs> Thanks to the Almighty that the class is not as it was in the beginning because cells were landed all over our village. But thanks to Colonel Baji and his team, we need help from the authorities because feeding is becoming a problem for us. Our kids are not going to school because their teachers are not reporting to work as a result of the current situation in our communities. The quick reaction force one commander Omar B. Bojang said his men have done a lot in ensuring that they restore hope in the minds of the internally displaced persons and safeguard their return and help to mitigate the economic loss. These are the red zones. This was where some of the rebels were staying behind. Um, 100 meters from here, you are in the Kasama. So um, the people here endured a lot of um, suffering, but however, with the confidence building patrols conducted by the armed forces, I was able to restore confidence and you see um, life is still going on. Normal people are doing their normal activities in the village. And uh, you know, the patrols were able to reduce the economic loss that was supposed to be registered by the region because um, the casus, as you can see, is their season. So without the villagers being able to harvest them at the right time, that would have been a serious waste. And when we conduct patrols also, um, by then there were no people in the village. So the animals uh, will be moving around because there is no one to provide water. But the soldiers will either pump and give water to the animals or they will make, stay here for an, uh, two, three hours to allow the people to come and give water to their animals. So the patrols were able to reduce the economic losses that are supposed to be registered by um, the region. Meanwhile, the Quick Reaction Force 1 is expected to shift the burden of duty to QRF-3 after three months of intensive patrol at the border. The exercise also served as a familiarization trip for the QRF-3 commandant, Abla Jata, and the village Alcalos. For Star TV, I am Modu El Baji. Now, April 25th is World Malaria Day, and the Gambia has joined the rest of the world in commemorating the day, as our SANE reports. World Malaria Day is marked annually on 25th April to focus global attention on malaria and its devastating impact on families, communities and societal development, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Bala Kande, the program manager for National Malaria Control Program, shed light on the day. World Malaria Day is a day that was set aside in uh, the year 2000 by heads of state. African heads of state met in Abuja in the year 2000 and they all agreed, you know, in principle to fight against malaria and also in, in that fight they have set themselves, you know, a target. They said by two, two uh, by, by, by um, within 10 years, malaria, the border of malaria will be half by 50%. So based on that, so every year, to remind the commitment, remind the African leaders about the commitment they made in Abu Dhabi in the year 2000, that is why all Malaysia is commemorated once every, every year on the 25th of April. To mm -hmm. so remind them of their commitment and to make sure their commitment is really followed on, you know, to see whether the targets have been achieved. This year's team aligned with the call to urgently scale on innovation and the deployment of new tools in the fight against malaria while advocating for equitable access to malaria prevention and treatment within the context of building health system resilience. 
Mr. Kande told Star TV how they would have celebrated it if it was not the Ramadan. Okay. You know, we are in Ramadan, but normally what we have done, we have organized a webinar. You know, that is a virtual call with international uh, uh, colleagues, of course, with uh, partners. So, you know, to, to, to discuss about the issues that are affecting the global malaria problem and then eventually to see what strategies that should be in place to make sure the GDP is really, you know, um, on, on, on all fronts. It's a webinar and also uh, it, uh, um, the press, uh, not person, uh, um, uh, a statement by the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Lamin Samadhi, you know, highlighting the importance of the day. He has already made a statement, a statement by other colleagues and partners and of course WHO to represent it. But this year we do not have a specific program for it. The past year has seen significant breakthroughs in malaria prevention and control in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. Landmark recommendations on the use of the first vaccine against malaria. World Malaria Day today is an occasion to renew political commitment and encourage continued investment in malaria prevention and control. The World Health Organization called on countries and communities affected by malaria to work closely with development partners to advance the countries along the road to eliminate while contributing to the achievement of other sustainable development goals. For Star TV News, our Sane. Now, the Turkish humanitarian and charitable organization TIKA, in collaboration with the Gambia Supreme Sami Council, on Monday distributed 200 Ramadan gifts to the needy. Dado Cham tells us more. The food items, which include rice, sugar, and cooking oil, were distributed at the Supreme Islamic Council headquarters in Carnifin. The president of the Islamic Council said this is an annual gesture for the council due to the smooth and long-term relationship between the council and Tika. In this country, uh, in the form of uh, distributing the uh, food items, this year, program uh, is targeting 200 beneficiaries from uh, different communities in Banjul, KMC, and West Coast region. So, alhamdulillah, it's a great opportunity for us in this month of Ramadan uh, to receive these important items from uh, Tika. He thanks the humanitarian organization on behalf of the beneficiaries and assure them that the gesture will go a long way for the needy. The president of the council disclosed that he is always praying that God continues to threaten the relationship between Turkey and Gambia. The coordinator of TICA in the Gambia, Madame Soli Bayer, said he is happy to coordinate such a gesture for the needy in this holy month. First of all, I would like to give information about our uh, organization. TICA, Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency, was established by the government of Turkey in 1992. We are not a uh, non-governmental uh, organization. We are directly bound directly to the government. The government. Yes. The government. So the main objective of today is to extend a helping hand to, to the people in need by providing uh, technical and development assistance also. The Turkish Cooperation and Coordination Agency, TICA, was established in 1992 to provide technical assistance to developing countries and established a relationship with them in areas of the economic, trade, technology, culture, education and social development through the implementation of projects and programs. Reporting for Star TV News, I am that. Now, the National Disaster Management Agency is set to disburse 13 million dollars to families affected by the MFDC Senegalese soldiers' classes in Kazamaz. Jacqueline Colley reports. Sering Modujuf, Deputy Executive Director of the National Disaster Management Agency, said the disbursement of the 13 million will start on Wednesday for the internally displaced persons. The population displacement is a result of the clashes between Senegal and the MFDC separative movement. The development came after a rapid assessment was conducted on the 18th of March 2022 and each family will receive $3,330 for three months. 
according to its assessment, there are twice more female-headed households as men. 67% are female-headed households, while 33% are male. On the 31st of March, the Senegalese launched a military operation in the southern region of Senegal, impacting all the Gambian border communities in Fony and the nearby districts. The districts affected in Fony are Kansala, Bintang, Karanai, Berefet, Jarol, and Bondale. Meanwhile, 20,208 people are affected by the clashes, of which 3,656 are host families, 5,626 are internally displaced persons, and 691 are migrants and refugees. Jacqueline Coley, reporting for Star TV News. Thank you very much. So tonight on the show, I'll be speaking to Dr. Ismail Sisi, not as leader of Citizens Alliance, but as political analyst. We'll discuss issues bordering on the parliamentary election, but also various events that have been happening in the past weeks and days in the country. Doc, thank you for joining me on my show tonight. Thank you very much, Lamin, for having me. It's thank you. So today you are here as a political analyst. So let's get started. Uh, just when one thought that the National People's Party um, have buried UDP, annihilated the party. We've seen the party manage, just about manage to drag themselves right back into Gambia affairs, going by the parliamentary election and the, their performance. I mean, what is your view and, and take on how UDP have been able to um, um, get themselves right back into the mix? Well, I think um, that makes Gambian politics interesting. You remember a while ago I, we had a discussion and I told you that for this, NAS, for this um, election cycle, brace yourself for ups and downs and the unpredictable. For me, it's not about how UDP is able to bring themselves up. It's about how NPP is not able to maintain the, uh, the, the successes of the presidential elections. Remember. UDP had 23 seats in parliament going to these elections, 23, 23 I think, I think they lost 8 seats, and they had 15 seats now. If you look at the votes also, um, they have maintained exactly what they were getting before. So it's about, it's about what they have, it's about the NPP not able to maintain what they have and they lost ground. Why do you think that the NPP was not able to maintain the momentum? I think one is complacency, overconfidence. They, Unexpectedly <coughs> defeated um, their opponents in the presidential elections, and also the selection, the manner in which they did the selection of candidates was also they, they, they did not also get that on right. But remember also, presidential elections are different from parliamentary elections. Parliamentary elections people vote for the candidate. Um, they look at certain factors. Uh, they look at um, so many other factors that are that are that has local consequences and local implications. And I think they fail to realize that. But I think they learn from this. And maybe going forward, they'll realize that um, you have to keep the momentum. You don't have to be over complacent. Uh, but also, you have to ensure you get the candidates right. So the NPP want a majority parliament. NPP majority parliament. Um, going by this, really, there is disappointment mm -hmm. in terms of that ambition and that goal. How is this parliament going to play out for our democracy? Well, it is going Do you to think this <laughs> is the right parliament for the Gambia? Um, well, yes or no. Yes, in the sense that now no party has a majority. It means that democracy will work in parliament. It means that there will be a lot of joking, political joking. It means that now, you know, they can hold each other accountable. But no, because also it could lead to stalemates where so there is that, that danger. There is that danger that it could lead to political still may be difficult to pass bills when there is no majority and, and so on and so forth. But interesting times ahead. Let's see how this whole thing will, will unfold in the next couple of months, couple of years. And we'll learn from it. Like I always said, we are in a process of learning. It's a new democracy. Some of these things are new. And therefore it is for us now to learn from these things as they evolve and then we start to make sense uh, with them and also make sure we pre it prepares us for the next election, election cycle. We have seen the complete wipeout of the GDC. What's your view on that? A party that did so well um, in 2016, uh, one would have expected GDC to be relevant still. But what we've seen, 
is 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 bad. But I think most observers saw this coming that the NPP's coming into the political scene wasn't very good for GDC, and we saw it. We saw a lot of the mass defection, top ranking officials from GDC to NPP, from GDC, and even the base um, started to erode and corrode with the coming of NPP taking their base. And remember that if you look at the leaders of the two parties, are from one region. In fact, I think from one constituency. So they have some things in common, and um, the same people that gravitate towards GDC are likely the same people that gravitate towards NPP. So therefore, and you know, incumbent um, having access to resources, having access to power, having access to you know, it's, it's incumbent. And yeah, remember that uh, many people in that many uh, the average Gambian voter in that part of the Gambia thinks they don't vote against. Um, the incumbent because it's there by God. So obviously we all saw this coming that GDC will have a very difficult time in maintaining also their momentum from 2016 and it showed in the National Assembly elections they are not able to get even a single seat. So going forward what is there, what does the future hold for, 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 for GDC? Well that's going to be very difficult for me to say. I don't know what is their next move going to be. We can only know that if we see their next move but for now we have not seen anything yet. So it's going to be very difficult for us to see what what will be there for GDC. I think we need to see now what GDC wants to do in terms of when we see that, then we'll know exactly how things will unfold for them in the coming years. And then one party also that appears or looks to be limping is the APRC, Fabakari Tomongjara APRC. They've, they've not done well at all. I mean, a, a party that was once dubbed the king of And we had always thought that... That's in Fonyi. Uh, sorry, in Fonyi. I always thought that Fonyi is the is the bedrock, is the is the is the base. PRC, they want two seats in. Um, but remember also, uh, no political party won in Fonyi. It's only independent candidates. So APRC still has a chance to get their seats back in Fonyi in the next elections because no political party now can claim to own Fonyi. APRC can still claim that perhaps they can own Fonyi. But remember also that I think they did well. If you remember. Political parties that were in power in Gambia, once they lose power, they, they, they erode out of relevance. They are, but APRC is still uh, being resistant. They are still here. The Speaker of the House, APRC, they've got two seats in Parliament. Um, the future might be bright for them, depending on also how they harness the relationship they have with the NPP and make it into good use. And, and also, we've also seen the proliferation or the rise of independence. These are people who did not uh, go to parliament uh, b b through any political party. They went independent and won. We've seen uh, a staggering 12. This has in the Gambia. Perhaps independent candidates can do the job. But now it's to claim um, the victory for independent candidates insofar as Gambian politics is concerned. It's still too high. It's just with the way MPP did their selection, many of the those who are disgruntled went to contest as independent candidates, and these are people who were influential in their communities, who did grassroots work in their communities, and they were, in fact, some of them, like the one in Kiang Central, is the community of of of, of Kabada, the entire Kabada wanted Yunusa yeah. Ba to contest. Um, the selection process produced some other some other candidate. But also, people have really shown that mainstream political parties, to be honest, are not to be trusted, and they now go for independent candidates. So let's, let's, let's if you look at the NPP, you look at the Greater Banjul, KM, uh, West Coast, these are the regions that, let's say, rejected the ruling National People's Party. And one would say that these are the most complex when it comes to politics in the Gambia. I mean, what, is, what do you read when you look at the voter in these three regions? What do you read in terms of their awareness, in terms of how they look at political parties? Well, over 55% of voters, almost 60%, live in these three, these three regions, which is named Banjul, Kem, and West Coast region. So it was, should worry the NPP that they were able to secure only one seat in these three regions. Now, one thing that you have to also understand is that voter turnout was very low, especially in these three um, constituencies. Um, past political apathy, people had lost faith in the system. After elections, we've seen how the cost of living increased, how you know there is some form of insecurity, people lost hope in, 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 you know, in, in governance in this country. So perhaps maybe people did not go out to vote. Um, we've asked some people why they did not vote, they didn't even know the candidates. 
but also NPP also lost most of these constituencies and if you want you can go and look at the figures because of the presence of independent candidates who, are, who took votes away from them but also presence of other new political party, parties like Citizens Alliance who also aid from the NPP uh, base. Um, if you look at the NPP candidates mm -hmm. total number of votes plus the in, uh, some independents that contested if you add them together for example Serekunda West NPP and the independent if you put them together with the UDP. Um, so those are some of the factors. One is because of the proliferation of independent candidates who took votes from NPP, but also because of low voter turnout. The low voter turnout was very low, 51% is very low. Doc, why didn't you contest? I've come across, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, arguments that Doc should contest. I mean, start from there. We've seen my party go to Woolley West to contest. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody heard from Dr. Ismail since the, your, the, 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 the fallout, I would, I, I would call it, 2021 20, fallout. No one heard from you. Yes, I think, uh, you know, we came into politics for uh, one reason. That is, we had the ideas, we had the solutions to transform this country, not to build it only for today, but to transform it for the next generation. We understood the problems of this country. That is why we contested. Now, we, our first attempt wasn't very good. Um, it wasn't a total failure in the sense that we had experience, uh, people got to know what CA is about, people get to understand our ideas. We got to get a following and we became relevant in Gambian politics. But results-wise, it wasn't very good because we were not able to contest the presidential elections. We also put up 10 candidates for the national assembly elections. We could not win any. Therefore, for us, it was a period where you need to take a seat and, and do some self-reflection within the party, within myself as an individual to say, what did we get wrong? Why did we go wrong? What did our strategy, did it work or fail? How did it fail? Why did it fail? We needed that, that, that space to really listen as well to the wider public, listen to critique so that when we come back, it can help us grow. So for us, that is, that is a strategy that, that we need to do. But also, as a political party, the only time we speak is to hold government accountable. Um, in terms of their actions and their policies. And we thought now this period from elections mm -hmm. to the time that President Barrow elects his, uh, appoints his cabinet, we need to give him that breathing space to, to, to get his act together, get his team together. When he starts now with his new team now, now we can start again holding him account to some of his, but I think we needed that space to, you know, let the, he's got a very, he's had a very turbulent five years, very, very turbulent five years. This is a time to cool down, let all heads cool down across the political divide. Think of what this should be the next direction for the country, and the president should lead that by getting his team. When he gets his team, now we as political party um, opposition now can start holding him accountable. But at a more personal and at a party level, it was a time for us to reflect and think, what which, what did we do right, what did we do wrong, where should we improve, what, are, what is the public perception about CA. You cannot know these things if you are still in the free, in the theater, being very active. So it's a time for us to really take a sabbatical and listen and learn and move on. Um, when it comes to the other question you asked about, um, what was it again? That was a question you asked. Uh, the reason why you didn't run. Yeah, the, why contest. I didn't run. I think people have choices, um, and people know their strengths and their weaknesses, and people run for office based on their strengths and weaknesses. I know I'm not a very good lawmaker. I'm a more of a pragmatic person. I like to implement. I know that I'm better suited. But this is for, about representation. Yeah, but I'm not, saying I'm not, better suited not, for local government. Local government. Local government. I mean, if I have a choice. So are you between, dropping this hint if that I have a choice, you might? No, what I'm saying is that if I have a choice between being in the legislature and being in the local government, I think my strengths are in local government. I like action. I like to see things happen. I like to implement. I'm, I don't think I'm a very good lawmaker. Um, and I wouldn't go and contest for national assembly election because people think people want me to do that I think where I can serve best. So that is why maybe I did not contest for the national. I understand your 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 back in the varsity. Yes. You you back to teaching. Is yeah, that, that's is my that true? That's my profession. I mean, politics is not my profession. We joined politics because we thought that we had a, we had we had solutions to the problems and it was time to do politicking. My profession is I'm a researcher. I'm an academic, a thoroughbred academic, and I think it would be a total waste of human resource if I should just sit for five years and do politicking and not take my uh, strengths to the university and teach the young people and prepare them for the future. So now I'm still on the parliamentary election and the aftermath. 
we've seen the nomination of some, some, some members, five, by President Adam Barrow. This has triggered some controversy. <laughs> the, the drafting in of Fabakari Tombongjata, uh, Sidinjai, really has triggered, caused some controversy in some quarters. Uh, you have critics, opposition critics, who say this is an insult to the struggle, to the entire Gambian struggle. What's your view? Well, my view is that the Constitution is very clear. It gives the President the power to nominate five people as he or, as he or she wishes as President. Um, there is no law which says that he cannot appoint, he cannot nominate those who he nominated. They have not broken any law insofar as we are concerned, where people have questions about certain moral aspects of what they did before. But I think Gambia should be a container where we cannot continue punishing people the rest of, for the rest of their lives. People make mistakes, um, and we move on. Let's give them a second chance. Everybody deserves a second chance to serve their country. That's anybody, and I would say here that anybody deserves a second chance to serve their country. If President Barrow thinks that he has confidence in these five people to serve national interest in the National Assembly, and he nominates them, and he doesn't it. What do you say to someone who is watching this and is not impressed by what you are saying and says, Dr. Ismail Asise has sold his soul to President Adam Barrow? Well, people, it is their opinion that President Barrow But is not... this true or not? Did you sell your soul to President Adam Barrow? I mean, who, nobody can buy anybody's <laughs> soul. I mean, people have, I mean, when you speak your mind in this country and your opinion differs from other people's opinions, yes. they say you sold your soul, you are looking for palazzo, brown envelope, those yes. are things that concern them. Yes. We speak our mind as we see things and nobody can intimidate us. No amount of um, character assassination can make us think otherwise. We don't, people don't control our minds. People cannot make us instruments in how we think. We think what we think is right. The president has a right to nominate five people and he thinks that he's nominated if five that he thinks can better serve his interests and interests of the country. Who am I to say that he should not nominate them? The problem is not with the president. The problem is with the law itself. We went to Abuja to see a new constitution because otherwise the problem is solved. The new draft constitution doesn't have that. It was coupled. If we had a new constitution today, the president would not be having the power to nominate five people. He's got the power to nominate five people. The last, uh, as a, last national, see, I've nominated other five people. Nobody complained. Yeah. So why are they complaining about these people who are Gambians, not found wanting by any commission of inquiry, not adversely mentioned by any uh, commission, and the president thinks that they can better serve the country. Who am I to say that he should not appoint them or nominate them? It's the president's choice. He has the power to do it. So be it. So, so let's also talk about your person still. I mean, your, your, your party, Citizen Alliance, this issue of this row, I would say, between some officials of your party and yourself, that you went to the president without the approval of your executive. I mean, and you met the president, and all of a sudden, Dr. Ismail, she said, changes. The president gives you money, gives you vehicles, and then, and then, and then that's it. Well, anyway, one thing I can say, I'm the leader of Citizens Alliance. Um, I was appointed, elected to lead, and I lead and do things that I see is in the best interest of the party. People can question the way I lead. That's up to them. It's their choice. Now, one thing I'll make very clear, or three things to get the facts straight. One, I never went to the president without the approval of the national executive. And they are alive. The party chairman is alive. Uh, before I went, the party chairman knew I was going. I did not call an executive because I'm going, no. But the people who I thought mattered in the executive knew I was going, that is one. Two, no vehicles were given to us to campaign and no money uh, was given for us to campaign. But this is the age of social media. When people are disgruntled, they can go out and say whatever they want to say. But did you campaign for President Barrow? No, we did not. We had a, a, a policy at CA that we are going to stay neutral and not endorse anybody. That any CA member, anybody within CA can go and campaign for whoever they want to campaign. We've seen our other people within the party want to endorse other party leaders. So if other people within the party campaigned for the president or for NPP using CA's name, that's up to them. But as far as we are concerned as a party, at an official level, we did not 
endorse anybody. We did not campaign for anybody as a party, and we did not take anything from anybody to campaign for anybody. I think that should be very clear. But also, there are talks that have been offered a position. That is why we've gone quiet, putting it on the record also, that no jobs whatsoever, form or shape or substance was discussed between me and the president. No job was offered. And as we speak, me and you today have not been given a job. And as we speak, Citizens Alliance is not an alliance with any political party. It is still an independent political party. That is why we contested 10 seats in the National Assembly election. Unfortunately, we were unable to win one seat. And these are the facts. And I think it should be very clear to everybody. Uh, and, and I was going to ask some, something related to that. I know very soon, pretty soon, maybe this, the president will... What type of cabinet would you want to see to help spur development, to help President Adama Barrow deliver on democratic dividends? Well, a cabinet that delivers. I think the president should now focus on delivering uh, and forget about politics. Politics for now is over. He is overwhelmingly being elected as the president of this country, indisputably. Nobody can question that. Now he's got the... Well, he has UDP to said he's told it, the election. Well, again, it's a matter of opinion. That's their opinion. We live in a democracy. Um, some people say he's won, some say he stole it. It's a democracy. We can debate this um, all day long. What is important is that the president, Mr. Pres uh, Mr. Adam Abaro, president Adam Abaro, has been elected for five years to govern and to serve the Gambian people. Now, he has the authority, he has to assert his authority and get the right team around him. And when we say the right team, we are not looking for a job. People watching, thinking that when we say right team is to bring us in. No, no. But, but are you let, interested? Are you interested? Uh, um, Before I let you continue, what, are you interested what I, what I can in... Say, what I can say is that we are driven by three instances insofar as interest is concerned. First, the national interest. Second, interest. And third, our own personal individual interest. For now, we are happy teaching at the university. That's what I love. But should the president offer you? Should the president offer me a job in his cabinet? Will cannot, you take? No, I cannot take that decision alone. Like I said, it has to go to the party. I'm head of a political party. These are very complex things. Being a political party head, serving in a government that has an opposition, opposition on your own. That offers to come to the national executive. Do you know what the say, executive will say? I, I don't know. That's why I'm saying if it happens and it comes. We'll sit and discuss and we'll take three things into consideration. Is it in the national interest for me to take this job? Is it in the party's interest, number two, secondary? Is it in the personal is it in my personal interest as a person? That is the last one. If it's in the national interest and in party interest, then we'll have to go for it because then my interest is not important anymore because we said we are going to serve country and party. But if all these three, if it fails the first of all, it's not in national interest. Obviously, we'll reject it. But like I said, there's no offer yet. Once that offer comes, now it's when we'll sit and scrutinize that offer and see what should we do as a party. And we'll inform the Gambian people um, duly if that happens. But for now, there is no offer. There is no discussion. There is nothing like a job being offered. What I would tell the president is let him get a team that can deliver in the next five days. It's about his legacy. Uh, Gambians are yearning for change, they are yearning for transformation, they are yearning for development. They are looking for policies and programs that can reduce the cost of living, that can provide housing, that can provide jobs for young people, that can ensure that people, when they are sick, they are cured. Our young people have access to quality education. That is what in rural Gambia, even in urban Gambia, there is un uninterrupted electricity. That is what people are wanting. And I think he's got the, opp the opportunities are there for him to deliver these goods. What he needs now is to get his right that can deliver, and then he'll have a successful five-year term. Doc, thank you for coming on the show tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's always interesting when, 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 when the dog is in the building. Thank you. Thank you very much. For joining David. me. Thank you. So that's it for, for me tonight. Uh, Dr. Ismail Asiza was my guest. Um, thank you for watching. I will see you on Wednesday. Until then, goodbye. From